Today on Investigate TV, DNA paternity labs left unchecked, faulty tests sparking suspicion within families. And that caused a lot of uh, heartache between me and my mom because I always felt like she was holding something back. And in crime labs, DNA backlogs leaving murders unsolved. We speak to a mother looking for closure. And for his life to get cut so short, so suddenly, so tragically, and, you know, we still left with so many unanswered questions. Plus, a nationwide police shortage. Officers retiring and resigning and crime numbers rising. And when you have fewer officers on the street, your response times are going to go down. Investigate TV starts right now. Hello and welcome to Investigate TV. I'm Lee Zurich. A lack of oversight in DNA paternity testing. These labs are not regulated by the FDA. They're largely left to their own devices. And when incorrect tests wreak havoc on families, critics say there is little accountability, as we discovered in Vile Mistake. B.J. Olson never met his father. I lived my life with only one, one parent and then lots of grandparents and aunts and uncles who, who looked after me. His mother told him she'd been intimate with two men, but DNA paternity tests didn't link either to B.J. And, uh, you know, that caused a lot of uh, heartache between me and my mom because I always felt like she was holding something back or maybe trying to protect somebody else when, uh, you know, I was just, just a young boy wanting an answer. All grown up, BJ submitted a saliva test to Ancestry.com and eventually discovered a relative. And at that time is when I saw that I had a connection to a first cousin, uh, my my Aunt Joanne, and uh, I had no idea who that was. Aunt Joanne's half-brother, one of the two people BJ's mom claimed to be intimate with. The DNA paternity test he took years ago was flawed. Two years after uh, my father had taken that DNA test, that the facility that he had taken it at was shut down. Uh, and there was some uh, conspiracies and fraud committed. We found similar complaints across the country of people claiming DNA labs provided incorrect tests. Faulty tests have denied children a father and linked men to children they never fathered. And for those labs, there's sometimes no punishment because the industry isn't regulated by the federal government. It's cloaked in secrecy. The American Association of Blood Banks has taken on some oversight by creating standards and voluntary accreditation for DNA labs that analyze blood to determine paternity. We requested an interview about its rules and standards. The organization declined and says the only way to learn about standards for DNA labs was to look at the organization's manual, a paperback about 50 pages of information. The rate for us and you to buy a copy, $100. $195. And again, we still had no way to get information on specific labs. A faulty test can have a lasting impact. BJ Olson never got to meet his father. He died. Hello. Well, hello, Sonny Boy. <laughs> come in, come in. Hi. Oh, good to meet you. Good to meet you. <laughs> oh, wow, come in. But BJ finally met his first paternal relative. I know your journey. It ain't been easy. Aunt Joanne, who helped fill in a little piece of Olson's family tree for so long, a missing branch. Yeah, you've been able to provide me with uh, some answers that I don't know that I would have had yeah. otherwise. Oh, good. So, good. I thank you. He has some of his life story filled in, but his birth certificate still carries a blank space where his father's name should be because of a vile mistake long ago. A state law kept BJ from adding his father to legal documents. That's because South Dakota places a statute of limitations for claiming paternity. It's also worth noting there are around 30 AABB accredited labs in North America. Those that our team reached out to for interviews or records either didn't respond or declined to comment. But DNA issues don't stop with paternity testing. Crime labs across the country are drowning in unprocessed DNA samples. 
we took a look at how the crisis is impacting New Orleans. The city led the nation in murders per capita for the first half of 2022. And as detectives scramble to solve cases new and old, they are often left without the evidence to solve them. My son was a brilliant young man, a brilliant businessman, and he was just really on his way. I mean, and for his life to get caught so short, so suddenly, so tragically, and you know, we still left with so many unanswered questions. You know, it's, it's very, it's very hard. November 2019, 22 year old Devin Espadron died fatally shot in Audubon Park. I'm just at loss for words for such a senseless, a senseless killing. And I don't have any answers. I don't, I don't, I don't even know why, why, why this happened. Nearly three years after this interview, she still waits for justice. Devin case is, uh, is considered a cold case now. The NOPD made an arrest in the case, booking Del Marcus Curtin with second degree murder. Released on bond, Curtin never got his day in court. He was shot and killed on the interstate. Months before Curtin's death, records show the NOPD collected a DNA sample and sent it off to the lab for testing. That DNA was stuck in storage for almost a year. It's very upsetting. It's very upsetting. Records show the NOPD collected the DNA sample on Curtin on March 16, 2020. Three months later, on June 18th, the NOPD sent it to the state's DNA lab, which state police operates. It took state police 229 days to process that sample, returning it on February 2nd of 2021. And it doesn't take that long to send a specimen off and to get results back. So why would it have taken that long to get results back? We found homicide cases that took as long as 770 days to get a DNA sample return. The numbers going by on your screen right now, the days it took NOPD to receive a return DNA sample in a homicide case. For cases involving rape, the story is much the same. Look at the number of days victims left waiting for a DNA sample to potentially help their case. This triple shooting left NOPD with five possible DNA samples and two swab kits. One victim was pronounced dead on scene. Those samples, too, have been sitting in the state lab more than 500 days waiting to be tested in return. The issue with um, DNA in a backlog has been an issue that's been going on for quite some time. State police says right now the NOPD has a backlog of 670 cases. That amounts to about one year's worth of cases the NOPD sends to the state every year for testing, all sitting on a shelf waiting. There's a person behind every single one of these cases. There's a victim, there's a person, there is a person's family uh, that's all impacted by, by these delays. The city pays state police for analysts to work solely on NOPD cases. The city funds seven positions, but state police says right now three are vacant. The NOPD told us in a statement any backlog related to DNA processing only illustrates the need for additional testing resources to be brought online throughout the state. Nearly three years after the death of Taishika Lawrence, her house is a memorial for the 22-year-old shot and killed and left in a car. And she was very lovable. She, if anything you needed, she had it. She would give it to you. Friends called Taishika Tootie. In November of 2019, she didn't show up to work. Tootie's father found her in Gentilly. It hurts a lot, not knowing who did it, why, and it's still out there, could do it to somebody else again. Her case, another example of the weight victims and families face. The NOPD sent DNA to the state lab about a month after her death, December 6, 2019. It took the lab more than a year to process and return the sample, 382 days. In some cases, possibly a missing piece to an investigation, sitting in storage, waiting to be tested. No, I should, no one should have to wait that long. I'm saying it's too long. That's over a year. I'm saying that is too long. In May of 2022, Louisiana State Police told us they had a DNA backlog of more than 3,000 cases statewide. 
Their statement said the turnaround time for expedited cases is approximately three to four months, but each case and scenario may affect the response time. Coming up in St. Louis, police solving cases, but more than 4,000 suspects walking free, no charges filed. How? We explain after the break. Welcome back to Investigate TV. Countless families waiting for justice. We've talked about DNA evidence piling up in storage, but in St. Louis, another logjam is keeping suspects and criminals on the street. Lauren Traeger from our station in St. Louis has more. It was just heartbreaking to see my son like lifeless at eight months. This St. Louis family still grieving months after losing little Jihad to a drug overdose while in the care of a relative. The circuit attorney has the information. They need to do something. Though News 4 Investigates has covered his tragic death from last year, to date, there are no charges and no justice. It cannot go unpunished. There must be some accountability somewhere. It's the kind of pain and frustration felt by many in St. Louis, anxiously wanting answers and accountability after falling victim to crime. But new data just obtained by News 4 Investigates, experts say is revealing alarming information about the criminal justice system in St. Louis. Having so many applications pending a decision is a huge problem and it needs to be addressed immediately. Richard Rosenfeld is a criminology professor who studied St. Louis crime for decades. Have we seen anything quite like it? Never, never. Here's exactly what we're talking about. Cases referred to as pending application of warrant or pause. They're criminal cases St. Louis police have solved, ID'd a suspect, and brought to the St. Louis Circuit Attorney's Office for charges. In the past, officers would apply in person in the warrant office in the city courthouse. But at the start of the pandemic, the prosecutor's office went virtual, an email system, and still have not returned to normal operations. After News 4 Investigates received a tip about a massive backlog of cases just sitting at the circuit attorney's office and going nowhere, we started making requests. The police department acknowledging a notable increase in the number of PAW cases. So just how many? More than 4,400 cases. No justice for victims. It's an astonishing number to Professor Rosenfeld. When you initially read that 4,415, what'd you think? I thought this cannot be true, can't be true. There's got to be a mistake here. The list is so long, in fact, that if you took the pages, laid them on the ground one by one, they would span the length of a football field. Let's say it's half, 2,000 pending warrants. That's still many, many too many. We asked the circuit attorney's office for an interview about this, but they declined. Instead, they sent a brief statement saying they, quote, went fully remote to protect the safety of our staff and our police partners, adding they are working closely with the police to process pod cases that, quote, target low-level, nonviolent offenders and focus the CAO's resources on the most serious and violent crimes. This issue of less serious, more serious stuff bothers me. But Rosenfeld says the CAO should be more forthcoming. Motor vehicle theft, terrorist threat. His brief review of the list obtained by News 4 from a police source shows high level felonies on it. Since they're not charged, many of the suspects are allowed to walk free. I don't think the public is aware that there could be over 4,000 applications for warrants uh, on some very serious offenses uh, that are in legal Purgatory. News 4 investigates further found some of the cases date back nearly two years. There's no excuse for having an application uh, be in pending status for that long. Rosenfeld wonders if it's a lack of staff in the office. News 4 investigates has in the past told you about an exodus of prosecutors from circuit attorney Kim Gardner's office. Is the office functioning if we've got this giant backlog? Not as well as it should be. And to get caught up, he says. It's going to take a hell of a lot of work. Um, and I hope the circuit attorney's office is up to it. That's just a, a, hor a horrible number.
Ed Pistacco knows just what it takes to run the Warren office. He did it for a decade, from 2007 to 2017. I don't know how they're going to make up for 4,000 cases because each of those cases has to be reviewed individually. And as you can, just the raw number is... That's a lot of cases. He says he's never heard of a backlog so bad. Sometimes we'd get a little backed up, but a little backed up meant, you know, maybe a couple of dozen. Again, we wanted to talk to Circuit Attorney Kim Gardner. After repeated requests spanning nearly a month, the Circuit Attorney's Office still hasn't provided an interview. It certainly sends up signal flares that there's a problem. Pistaco says it's something the office should take very seriously. Who are those 4,000 people that are suspects? Are some of those people dangerous to the community? The St. Louis Metro Police Department did not agree to an interview, but it did provide a statement saying, quote, we have attempted to work with the CAO's warrant office to streamline and correct this deficiency. Up next, police departments losing manpower, violent crime on the rise. How is it impacting communities? We hear from a police lieutenant and criminology expert after the break. Welcome back to Investigate TV. A shocking exodus across the country. Police departments are struggling with recruitment and retention. Earlier this year, the Chicago Police Department was over 1,000 officers short of its staffing target. That's according to the Chicago Sun-Times. In a radio interview, former NYPD Commissioner Bill Bratton predicted a crisis level shortage in New York City for the next several years. And the LA Times reports in fiscal year 2022, San Diego police saw a 52% spike in officers leaving the department. And most of those who left resigned. So what does that mean for your community and its safety? Amy Cutler from our station in Phoenix has the details. It beats on my heart every day I think about it. LaKenya Moses finds it hard to talk about the murder of her daughter, Jalen Alston, how she went missing, how her body was found, and how two years later, there's still no arrest. You just focus on who did it and why. And I feel like once we get the perpetrators or perpetrator, um, we can be be begin to heal. The 18-year-old's body found back in January 2020 in an office building in West Phoenix, a week after her dad, Jimmy, reported her missing. Investigators say cleaning crews smelled something leading to her body. Each year, LaKenya wears a sweatsuit with her favorite photos of her daughter on it. She wears it every Sunday. It's captured who she was. Jalen's case isn't unique. 28% of homicides in Phoenix in 2020 haven't been cleared, meaning there's been no arrest. There's been a steady improvement in homicide clearance rates in the city since 2016, when 54% were. But clearance rates for violent crimes overall, including manslaughter, rape and assault, were just 29% last year, meaning there was no arrest in more than 70% of those cases. For property crimes like burglary, car thefts, and arson, less than 11 percent of cases get cleared. I asked Phoenix PD why. There's a high number of property crimes uh, which spread out uh, amongst a, a, you know, just an average number of detectives. It's a really big caseload to try and manage. Dr. Bill Tyrell, a professor with ASU School of Criminology and Criminal Justice, tells me it's to be expected. Homicides are the priority for police departments. They put their best officers and the most resources toward solving them. Really homicide, sometimes aggravated assault, are really the only two that generally will get above 50 percent clearance rate. Staffing is a significant issue. Phoenix is looking to hire 400 plus officers. That means about 15 percent of positions are currently unfilled. It's huge. Uh, it's absolutely huge. I, I think you you see fewer officers on the street. Um, our numbers uh, say that. Uh, and when you have fewer officers on the street, your response times are going to go down. The data Phoenix provided doesn't show a decline in clearance rates for violent crimes yet, but it does indicate they're clearing fewer property crimes. Lieutenant Dave Albertson says it's having an impact. The more I give them, uh, the less likely they are to solve. Just being connected. This makes me connected. But doing her part to draw attention to the case so that her daughter 
isn't another statistic. Coming up, a shortage of specialized doctors is slowing down criminal investigations. Hear how hospitals are looking to technology as a stopgap. Welcome back to Investigate TV. Forensic pathologists investigate violent, sudden deaths, gathering medical evidence. They are often key witnesses in the courtroom. The U.S. has about 500 full-time board-certified forensic pathologists. That's according to the National Association of Medical Examiners. But it says we need more than twice that number. Ohio's Stark County hasn't had a forensic pathologist for nearly two years. But as Sarah Goldenberg reports, it's turning to tech for a solution. Some medical examiners and coroners are now using CAT scans to help identify causes of death. It's like a virtual autopsy using 3D imaging without leaving a mark behind. We recently spoke with the Stark County coroner. They're one of many offices in Ohio and across the country facing a forensic pathologist shortage. Because of that, we learned they're sending their autopsies to another county because they can't do them themselves. 19 investigates found they're looking into using CAT scans to help lighten that load. This is more of a just a roughed in room right now. They built a special room into their newly designed facility for a machine. Here's Dr. Ron Rusnak. That might be something that will help uh, as a middle piece. I mean, ultimately, I still think we will need forensic pathologists, but we need to find something in, in the interim while we have this shortage. So um, I'm looking at that as a possible tool to help uh, to help the gap. Dr. Rusnak says CAT scans are more commonly used for this in other countries, but it's catching on here too. 19 investigates found here in Ohio, Franklin, Hamilton, and Montgomery counties have the machines. Dr. Rusnak says overdoses should have autopsies, but most coroners don't have the manpower for that right now, and a CAT scan could help. A CAT scan would be a nice tool in between where we'd be able to get an idea. Did they have a head bleed? Did they have an aneurysm? Did they have uh, some abdominal uh, injury that isn't apparent on the, the gross examination? So not only you know, did they have drugs in their system, but there still could have been another uh, medical event that possibly could have caused their death or contributed to their death. The Stark County Coroner's Office is still trying to hire a forensic pathologist. They just upped the salary to $200,000 for the position, the highest paid position in the county. Now, once this position is filled, the county plans to help neighboring areas perform autopsies to offset the high salary. Thanks, Sarah. That's it for us. If you want to see more content like this, check out our YouTube page or download our apps on Roku, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire TV. We will see you next week.